It's an honor to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm going to do my best to talk for a short period of time, which is a little hard for me because I've been asked to leave time to break out into sessions, so I'll do my best. Um, but I'm going to talk about feeds today. Um, I'm, I think feeds are one of the more recent exciting things about social computing and social media systems. Um, and they're not fraught without, they're fraught with controversy sometimes, but there's so many, so many pros to them. Um, this is a snapshot of Twitter. Um, Twitter, um, how many of you are not familiar with Twitter? So I don't have to, okay, great. Um, so there's some, been, some interesting algorithmic phenomena that happened with Twitter. Um, Twitter introduced, you look at it, you don't realize how much algorithms might be playing a role here, but there's a trending feed here in Twitter, in Twitter and it's changed over the years. Um, in the beginning, everybody saw the same trends. Um, one day, uh, Twitter decided to change the Twitter algorithm and instead of seeing Justin Bieber tweeting, uh, trending at the top as it had been for six months or so, overnight lots of teenage girls were shocked that um, their favorite singer was no longer there. Um, Twitter then had to publicly announce that they had to change the algorithm so that they could get some valleys and some smaller peaks that weren't just the big phenomena. Um, these girls got so upset that they decided to come up with the code and instead of tweeting about Justin Bieber, who they knew would be somewhat blocked, they started tweeting about uh, Jeeber and just swapping the first two letters of his first and last names and they got him trending again. Um, so people, when, when they realize, most people realize there's an algorithm in a feed when it breaks. They don't often realize until that happens. But we see feeds in our daily life. This is an example of Google News. And here you actually have some control over your feed. So that gives you an idea that there's some algorithm, algorithmic play there. This is a snapshot of Pinterest. Uh, I'm sorry, Polyvore, similar to Pinterest. Um, and one might wonder, like, why am I seeing this dress, this dress first? Why am I not seeing this drum kit first? Um, this is an example of Behance, one of Adobe's social media sites. Um, and this one, I think, is there's something interesting about the ambiguity here, because in some ways, the ambiguity of what you see in a feed could be helpful. Do you read this left to right? Do you read this top to down? What does it mean if something's in the lower right-hand corner versus in the upper left-hand corner? Um, and we're seeing feeds in our daily lives even more. Like, what happens when feeds start going into our health domain and we're going through the cafeteria and the feed says, well, your friend James just had a salad. Why are you eating this burger? Um, so thinking about feeds, I think, is kind of um, important to think about how they are going to flow into our daily lives, which they already are. Um, even beyond that, um, you see this interesting prioritization happening. Let's say I want to take a class on Coursera. It suggests I take this class here. What about some other classes that might be of use to me? Um, what is it that prioritizes some classes over others? And when and if, how can we find out if there's any, any play of somebody paying to move something to the top of a list? Um, for many, many studies have shown so far that you cannot tell when something is sponsored on Facebook, um, even though it's listed there. People just don't realize the difference. But what I'm really passionate about is social feeds, when people talk to one another. Um, this is a snapshot from Facebook. Um, in, in, I mean, this, this feed is incredible. Um, how many of you used Facebook in 2006 when it first came out? Or 2004, I think, is when it first came out, if I'm not mistaken. OK, a few of you. Um, so the feed did not exist then. Um, when it first came out, it was called The Wall. Um, and prior to that, you know, you'd find your friends on Facebook. It was very similar to Friendster. Um, and, and you were almost done. You were almost done. Um, then they introduced the feed, which got really bad backlash when it first came out. People were furious. They're like, how dare they keep posting these, these updates? Like, I don't want people to know what I'm doing. I don't want to have to always be on and keep posting things. Um, but in many ways, that was one of the most brilliant things they could have done. It was very reminiscent of the piazza in Italy, uh, the Agora in Athens, this idea of a place to go to see and be seen. I um, mean, one of the things that I think is more brilliant about it is it's a place you can go to and be alone and actually be social while you're alone. It's great for introverts, but you can also go there with somebody else and actually have a more synchronous style of interaction. Um, and it's, it's helped bring people back again and again. I'm, I'm quietly confident it increases page views. Um, but people enjoy it. And there's been many studies showing how if you are a producer on Facebook, it's better for your mental health. It helps you. If you're a consumer solely, um, there might be some effects that are less understood. Um, and even beyond that, um, I've always been a really big fan of the work by Jib Holland and Stornetta. And they wrote this one paper where they looked at 
some of the the connection needs that human that the human requirements, which when met encourage and facilitate interaction. And of these, they came up with Q variety by aggregating all this work, feedback, message personalization, simultaneously being reminded of the need to talk to someone, having a common communication channel, turn-taking repair, stylized openings. And the Facebook feed has all of these. When they were writing this paper beyond being there, they were thinking about you know, telepresence environments. But this feed is this alternate form of communication that captures all of that. That said, I was still struggling to understand it. I was captivated, captivated by it and didn't get it. And then one day, sitting around with colleagues, you know, the wonderful Christian Sonvig, Kevin Hamilton, Cedric Lambert, we were staring at this one, one thing. And Christian had posted this, this big crystal for her pen. And we could not figure out why it was at the top of our feeds for so many weeks. What was it about this one post that moved it to the top? Um, and if you look at it, it's actually a parody post. The reviews are, are, it's more of a performance piece than an actual thing that you buy on Amazon. But it moved to the top and we couldn't figure out why. And you had four people that were college educated trying to make sense of why this was happening. We made our own Facebook groups, tried to like things. Um, we made pages trying to figure out what we could do to move things to the top and we couldn't do it. So we decided to study it further. Um, in our attempts to do that, we decided to go to the approach of what we call the narrative visualization, where we take people, subjects, on a tour of their feed, and then, oh, um, I just realized James, I have a snapshot of James saying something from a long time ago <laughs> that wasn't intentional. Um, <laughs> that uh, we, thought, we thought we'd walk people through a feed and, and see what they thought, not tell them anything, just take them on this guided journey. And so we did. Um, uh, Motahari Islami built this tool called FeedViz. And what you're seeing here is on the left, you're seeing all the posts you would have seen if every single person on your, um, on your Facebook network had posted something. You would see everything from anyone in your network. On the right, we put, using the API, the things that appeared on your feed. And so what you're seeing here, um, anything that's blue, a light blue here, um, appeared in your feed. So you're already starting to see some holes here. Uh, I didn't see that Cliff Lampy liked a post. Um, here you can see again, I saw all of these, but anything that's white, I missed. So I missed um, you know, three, four posts here. For most people in our study, this was the first time they had any idea that they didn't see everything from their network. The first thing they realized scrolling down was that this column here was roughly three times as long as this column on the right. Um, we then took them to the next stage where we let them see posts from their friends. We connected this to a human, to a person. And here on the left, what you're seeing is people, we just randomly chose three people whose posts you never see, three people where you roughly see half of their posts, and three people where you see most of their posts. Um, and you can refresh this button and keep seeing this, this list keeps growing and growing and growing. And again, many people for the first time realized that they had never seen posts from any of the people in this list. They saw roughly some posts from people, and it's roughly half of posts from people in this list. And many of the posts, most of the posts from people in this list. And it got them trying to think about why is this happening? People particularly got viscerally angry if there was a family member in this column or this column and they didn't see their posts. And we were exploring the different levels of awareness. Um, and of the people who were unaware, um, they were like, oh, I bet I didn't see that, asking them beforehand. I bet it would be on my newsfeed. I probably would catch it at some point during the day. Or, so I probably don't scroll down enough, but you know, you can't always scroll down so much. You just kind of go like a few posts. Um, he said, if I want to go back to my story, it's probably accessible. I'll probably find it if I took the time. So most people essentially blame themselves for not seeing a post. There are different paths to awareness. Um, some people inductively compared feeds um, for why they do. Like I have like 900 some friends and I only see 30 of them, so something's going on there. Um, some had more deductive reasoning. There's too much material in general, um, so you're not going to see all of it. Um, and then we were trying to explain why some people understood and why some didn't, and we looked at some features, and we discovered that it didn't matter how long you're on Facebook, it didn't matter the percentage of your scene versus total content, the network size did not matter. What did matter was how often you used Facebook, your activity level, if you were a heavy poster, if you'd ever made a Facebook page or managed a group. Um, so for example, there were some bar owners that we interviewed um, that 
actively tried to get people to their pages. And they were very, very clever about how they did that. And also, if you had a Facebook page, you also get an email from Facebook giving you statistics about the usage patterns. Um, and people who'd use the comments. Um, one thing that was interesting is at the top in recent stories, um, there's actually a button on Facebook. And people, most people assume that you always see Facebook stories chronologically. But it turns out the default is that you see top stories. And even if you move it to chronological, it'll default back to top stories after some time. Um, so when the study was done in 2014, um, 2013, 2014, roughly only 37.5% of people were aware of the algorithm behind the Facebook news feed. Um, the reactions that we got were pretty interesting. Um, and again, people were quite angry, and I want to stress initially. Um, so do they actually hide these things from me? Um, mentioning the unseen stories. Um, one person um, used the metaphor of the matrix. It's, ten, it's kind of intense because you've seen the movie The Matrix. It's kind of like waking up in the matrix in a way. I mean, you have what you think of as a reality of like what they choose to show you. And then the what the hell Facebook, and then lots of words we couldn't print on the screen. Um, people were originally very, very angry. Um, and for many of them, it was uncovering some misperceptions, and they were getting these light bulb moments. Like, I know she had some family issues, so I just thought she deactivated her account. Um, that was her explanation for why they didn't see any of her posts. Uh, like, I've never seen her post anything, and I always assumed that I wasn't really that close to that person, so that's fine, but what the hell. Um, and then there were different expectations that came out as they were talking to us through this, almost like a therapy session. Some people were upset they didn't see somebody's post asking for help because they really felt that they could help that person. And this came up again and again and again. I think she needs support for that, mentioning to Nachon's story. If I see it, then I will say something to support her. And what's really interesting to me there is that, that the Facebook literature su um, supports that, that you can help people actively by producing content online and by having discussions with them. Um, for now, I can't really understand how they categorize these people. Actually, this is my brother. And actually, he needs to be here, um, moving in from one column to another. So people were really angry. Um, we, we kept them in the room. Um, and then we had a second part to the study where we showed them all the people and asked them which category they wanted, we wanted them, they wanted the people to be in. Like, should this person, this person was categorized as mostly seen, should they be in one of the other two columns? And we did the same thing for content. So for example, this was, um, these were seen posts, but you could click on it if you did not want to see it. And these were unseen posts, and you can click on it um, if you really had wanted to see it. Um, and it turns out that finally, people were actually kind of OK with their feed. The majority of the folks had comments akin to, a lot of what is filtered out are just things that don't really pertain to me. I'm so grateful, because otherwise, it would clutter up what I really want to see. Or honestly, I have nothing to change, which I'm surprised, because I came in like, oh, they're just screwing it all. And so through this course of this narrative visualization, people were changing their minds. Um, and again, I'm going very briefly on this. I'm not talking about the sample. I'm not talking about the length of the study. If you have questions, please ask. Feel free to interrupt as I'm talking. Um, but I just want to sort of get at the, at the gist of this. Um, and the other thing we discovered throughout this as they were talking is they were all giving us all of these folk theories for why this was happening. Um, and this got me really interested because um, in graduate school, I'd been introduced to this gentleman named Kempton. And he discovered this coexistence of folk theories and institutional theories. Um, in his work, he studied thermostats. And he explored two theories of thermostats. He interviewed a bunch of people and found that they primarily fell into two camps. There's one group of people that believed, he called it the feedback theory, um, that the thermostat was a switch, that once the temperature got too low, your heat would kick on. Other people thought the thermostat was more like a valve. so almost like the sink, that if you turn it on more, it gets hotter faster. And one of the things that was really interested in, interesting in his findings is interviewing all these people and then looking at logs of the usage patterns of, the, of these thermostats, is he found that each of the abstracted theories produced inefficiencies and advantages. So there were people that, so the experts say widely agree that it's more of a switch theory, not a valve theory. And yet some of the people using the valve theory had more efficient heat usage. We found the exact same thing with the th theories that people were making for their Facebook feeds. So before the probe, we interviewed people um, who were aware that there was an algorithm there. And they came up with four general theories. Um, this personal engagement theory about how involved I get in my feed. Global, uh, we called it a global popul popularity theory, a format theory, a narcissist theory. Um, 
and if you want more detail, I can refer you to a paper. Um, what I want to get here with, with this is showing that how many more theories arose after they used our narrative visualization. And what's interesting is that after even the unaware folks used the narrative visualization, they all came up with the exact same theories after the fact. So by using the tool, we got the unaware folks and the aware folks thinking along the same lines. Um, after the follow-up, we came back and talked to folks two to six months later. And one of the things that we found um, was that roughly 80% of the people had the same or higher satisfaction with their feed than they had before. Um, I'm more interested in checking Facebook because it does not seem as cluttered with write-up information. Um, because I know now that not everything I post, everyone else will see. I feel less snubbed when I make posts that get minimal or no response. It feels less personal. Um, and again, there were some people that had lower satisfaction because they're like, I'm disappointed because I keep thinking that I might be missing some updates from friends. Um, but overall, people reported that they kept going back to Facebook more and more. Um, again, this is self-report. And they kept reporting that they were more conscious of what they did on their feed to try to get what they wanted to appear on. And many people actually claimed that their feed was better because of their more active and careful participation. And so some of the hypotheses that arose from this were that you know, algorithm awareness increased engagement for our users. Um, people did not want a full model of how this algorithm worked. Um, they didn't care. They didn't want 700 plus features to follow. They wanted a general idea if, if I do this, then this might happen. And we found this alternative, excuse me, seamed interaction experience was very, very helpful to them. And they wanted to keep using this tool after the fact. Note, it's not the sort of tool you would use all the time, but something you might want to use at intervals. Which then led us to the question of, should users even be aware of the role of algorithms and filters in their new sources? And if so, how? Um, in addressing the how, three general approaches have been used so far. People have been trying to undo the bias or the prioritization in feeds. Um, for example, in Facebook, one might argue that one way to undo this is to just always put everything in most recent mode. So you see everything chronologically. However, it's not clear that that makes it unprioritized or unbiased. What does it mean to, like for example, what does it mean to unbias a Twitter feed from politics? What does it mean to unbias something? It's a very difficult problem that's fraught with its own issues of an algorithm to unbias something that you then have to interrogate as well. Um, second approach people use is make the viewer aware of the prioritization explicitly or abstractly, which is the approach that we're embracing. And three is to allow the user to create their own prioritization algorithms. And I'm going to talk briefly about the latter two here. So in terms of seams and transparency, um, our approach, the social visualization that we use, the narrative visualization used a, a seam, a side-by-side -side comparison where it created a, a rigid schism in the center. Um, for years, you know, many people argued for more seamless interfaces, and this was considered like the norm, um, or actually the epitome, what you strive for. And this is an example of orbits. Very simple interface, you put in your origin, put in your destination, you get a very nice slick ordering, you try to choose the top one that you like. This too was fraught with controversy. There was a time when they were, it was discovered that if you're using an OSX system, you are getting more expensive flights first than if you're using a different type of system. Um, and it took a long time for people to realize this because it wasn't expected. There was nothing in the interface to say to you, look, because you're using a Mac or because you're doing this, you're not getting this interface. There was these expectations that people held. Um, an, an alternative approach, which is much more seamful, um, is the kayak approach. Um, and when I first saw kayak, I didn't like the aesthetic of it at all, to be honest with you. I'm not sure that I like the aesthetic today. Um, but what's interesting about it is it inspires trust in people because it actually pops up the sources for where you get that data and you see it changing in real time. And it gives you some hints. It shows you this, this slight reveal. And this idea of seamful inter interfaces is not ours. Um, the first paper I read about it was by a gentleman named Matthew Chalmers. And he was, the classic example he used was looking at edges and gaps in 802 coverage. And by showing people these edges and gaps in coverage of whether it be telephone network or Wi-Fi network, it made people smarter and more intelligent about their choices of how they use the system. Um, and they became more expert users. Um, so the FeedVis system, in some way, provided this seam. It showed you these holes here for what you didn't see. It showed this, this contrast scheme here. And you're starting to see a few more of these sort of like comparison systems today. This was a, a visualization made by the Wall Street Journal where they use Facebook's data to actually categorize something as being more liberal or more conservative. Um, keep in mind, this also has an algorithm in it. So there's like a meta level here of an algorithm being used to interrogate a different type of algorithm. Moving to the third approach. Oh, Michael. Uh, just to make sure I understand, 
the scene you're talking about is the scene. Is it sort of like unzipping and seeing inside of it, like you're seeing, like what it's not showing you, or is it is the scene about like where the edge of where the system breaks down? So what's what's interesting about scenes, I think, is where you reveal something that was not meant to be seen. It's often think thought of as a mistake. So for example. Um, I think some of the best teams, like if I, if I had charge of Facebook for a day, I would make a glitch day where I would say that they leave the print statements in um, and you can say it's like printf number of people who saw this page is that. So that's an example of a seam. An example of a seam is where you make a reveal for something that um, might, people might think of as a mistake or might not want to show you. For example, if you're showing a feed of what you actually saw, um, you wouldn't also see what everyone else showed you. So by definition, if, say, Facebook made this, did this themselves, then it wouldn't be a scene because they've made a design decision. But if I, as some third party, build a tool like this, it's seamful because it's, it's different than what Facebook is Well, I would show. argue that Facebook could also do it. I would argue that they could also do it by revealing something that normally wasn't revealed before. So it's a, it's a, it's a temporal change there. They didn't do it in the past. By doing it today, it becomes a scene because they didn't do it yesterday. Okay, so the, so like the launching of the news feed was a moment of scene yeah. design. Yes, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and so we're starting to see, I mean, in, in our work, we found that the side-by-side -side comparison is one of the most powerful ways to see something in an algorithm. Um, the idea, moving to the third uh, approach of using, um, creating your own, calibrating your own algorithm is something that we toyed with in 2009, 2010 um, with the brilliant Eric Gilbert. He made this tool called WeMetal, and the idea here was that he was exploring algorithms for tie strength, and he made this widget here. Um, where you actually did some social zooming. So if you move this widget towards the inner circle, you saw more Twitter posts from your inner circle. And if you move that little line down to your outer circle, you saw more posts to your outer circle. But you actively made that decision. And you can also choose other parameters here from communities that were created using some simple matrix clustering. Um, and we got lots of amazing comments about this interface. People were using it over Twitter as their daily Twitter uh, reader. Um, we got a small fan base in South Korea for some reason that we don't understand. Um, um, and notice here, though, that in terms of creating the interface, there's more than just these controls. There's more than these like two panels of control panels. Look at the typeface. Look at the flow. Um, we're, changing, we're changing the typeface here. So for example, by moving that scroll bar, um, the type font becomes more bold. It becomes more of a serif font instead of a sans serif font. So you're looking at this page and you're like, wait a second, this person is different than that person. There's a level of communication happening here that something is different about this post than the post below it or the one below that. And so we're trying to communicate using typeface that not all tweets here are created equal. Um, and using this um, control panel approach is exactly what what Google is doing here with our Google News. And now, more so, Twitter is starting to adopt this typeface approach where if you have something that has more likes or more retweets, they're actually changing the typeface for you um, to give you some idea that something is happening. Another approach that might be useful is to maybe borrow other people's algorithms. So there was a system, um, I don't think it's around today. How many of you have ever used a system called Trove? It was created by Commander Taco, um, um, who is amazing. Um, and the idea here is, so look, I can't figure out Facebook's algorithm, but maybe I really, really like you know, Michael's taste. And so I can adopt part of Michael's algorithm and say, I want a little bit of Michael's algorithm. I want a little bit of Joy's algorithm. I want a little bit of Justin's algorithm. Um, and then I create my old algorithm that way. And so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to bring in some of the beyond, beyond being there from what's obvious about the Twitter feed that we've had so far, like the chronological order, and saying like we can create some of our own approaches. And as long as we understand them abstractly, that might be enough. Um, that also leads to bias. Um, this is another interface that we created trying to show bias in tweets. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that for a second. And so in terms of bias, we were trying to understand which tweets were more liberal and which tweets were more um, conservative, similar to the Facebook project that, that um, or the Wall Street Journal project that used the Facebook data. But in exploring Twitter data, we found something that we thought was quite interesting, not unexpected, but quite interesting. We were looking at all the input data that we had, and this is doing Twitter query search. So you put in a, a search for Twitter, you see what comes out. It turns out that when you do query searches over political topics, predominantly most of the data in all of Twitter is democratic to begin with. So here, what does it mean to talk about bias if most of your data is biased 
from one way. What does it mean to talk about a bias of the ranking algorithm if your input data is biased? Take that one more step thinking about learning algorithms. What does it mean if you have an algorithm if your training set is biased one way? Your training set is very much going to influence the output of your algorithm. And so we were looking at putting in queries and seeing what happened to them. And what we found, at least for the period of 2015 of December on Twitter, is that it's very hard to be Republican. If you think of this as a scale of your affiliation, Democrat being one and Republican being minus one, and I apologize for that labeling, we had to choose one or the other, and zero being neutral. Um, if you had an input, um, let's look at the very top one. So if you're um, Donald Trump and the input bias was 0.19, so anything about Donald Trump was roughly skewed Democratic. Once it got through the ranking algorithm, it became even more Democratic. So it was really hard to be a Republican in December of 2015. Um, and it's not clear what it means to remove this bias. Like when I talked about earlier about removing a bias, what does it mean to, re to remove a bias in this case? We don't know. How do you explain? Yeah. Is there, I want to unpack what's causing this. Yeah. So it could be. The, it could be an intentional design decision or it could be a secondary effect of the behavior on Twitter. For example, Democrats retweeting the things about Donald Trump that are you know, mm -hmm. favorable to their worldview, which the ranking system catches is like, oh, it's popular. So yeah. it's an intent. Like, so yeah, it's controlled for that. It's <laughs> interesting. It's controlling, for, it's controlling for retweets popularity. So even after you remove the... The, the social signals that the they're getting. The trends were the same, yeah. And and can we, and this also controlled for, for example, like um, number of followers or network position of, of the individual. Like, network, you can imagine that. Network position, no. Network position, no. But the trends are very similar. At the end of the day, though, um, there's a self selection here going on in terms of the content that's on Twitter. And that we don't know, I don't know how to unpack that. I think that's a great question for future research. Um, but this is one case that we found here. And so one of the things that I want to mention in looking at this bias is one, bias is important, but we only shouldn't look at the algorithm bias. We have to look at the data, the training data. We have to look at the input bias as well. Um, which leads me to an, an, a slightly bigger question about bias online and algorithmic systems. Um, so whoever was at lunch today, I've talked about this very briefly, but there's lots of different sites that, that have feed. So example, let's say I go onto Zillow and I look for a house. Um, I might get an ordering of, of homes there. Let's say I go to homes.com. Let's say I go to Trulio. There's so many different sites out there. Um, a bias there not only has you know, implications for relationships, but also has legal implications because it's, because it's illegal. Um, you know, for, in fair housing, um, with Christian Sonvig, Kevin Hamilton again, and Cedric Lambert, um, we were exploring fair housing. Are racial minorities less likely to find housing via algorithmic matching systems? Um, in November of 2016, um, Edelman at Harvard wrote this wonderful paper looking at Airbnb and showing that if you're black, you don't get um, the offers that white people get for rooms. He also showed earlier in a different study that if you're a black landlord, you don't make as much money as a white landlord would make for the same unit if it's controlled for location, square footage, and so forth. Um, so there's a clear evidence of algorithmic bias in terms of race, gender, and ethnicity. Um, and the reason that I think it's critical that we address this is because we have the Civil Rights Act um, dating back to 1964 that decreed that race simply could not be considered in some situations regardless of the context, nuances, or consequences. And employment and housing definitely fall into those categories. After that, the Fair Housing Act, um, um, extending from the Civil Rights Act, originally prohibited discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. In 1988, they also added disability and familial status. Then, the Housing and the Community Development Act um, was built to enforce the Fair Housing Act. It further supports special projects, including the development of prototypes to respond to new or sophisticated forms of discrimination against persons protected. So this idea that the government was explicitly putting an act in that says that we need third parties to go in and investigate discrimination. We have to make sure it does not exist. Um, and there was a format for doing this. There's a traditional audit that many of you have probably heard of. The most common one you probably hear of is people taking resumes and keeping the exact same resume, but changing the name of it, and maybe making one sound more black, and maybe having the other name sound more white, and submitting these and seeing what happens. Um, in housing, one of the things that you do is you create pairs of people matched on family and economic features. They successively visit realtors, 
and researchers control and isolate discrimination. Um, the first national paired, paired testing study happened in 1977. Um, the most recent one that happened uh, was in 2012. And as you can see, um, what people are told about and what they're shown differs across different categories. Um, and so discrimination, I would argue, is getting better since we've had some education, since these laws have been in place. But still, it's happening in face-to-face -face visits. And we found, and Edelman's confirmed, that it's happening in online systems as well. So we wrote this paper um, in 2014 about auditing algorithms. And how do you take these algorithms and find, um, and find where this discrimination or bias might be happening? Um, and again, because I, I went for, I'm aiming for a shorter talk, and I'll try to be done in five minutes so we can break out into groups and have discussion. Um, but the result of this paper ended up in a um, big data report from the White House um, in May of this past year. Um, and they named five national priorities that are essential for the development of big data technologies. And one of them was algorithm auditing. Um, specifically, to promote academic research and industry development of algorithmic auditing and external testing of big data systems to ensure that people are being treated fairly. This was like a mandate by the US government. Um, that said, the team that drafted this document, um, many of them are not going to be there after this week. So that, that puts a cloud of ambiguity over the, the future of this work. Um, that said, um, as a result of this, um, my colleagues and I, along with colleagues at Northeastern um, and a media company, um, decided to um, pursue this further with the government, specifically with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So uh, for those of you not so familiar with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, this criminalizes certain computer-related acts. So certain uses of CFAA have been denounced by security and discrimination researchers, though, who have commented that what we could go to jail for all security research at any moment. Um, so in our lawsuit, we're basically claiming that we would like the right as researchers to investigate um, housing discrimination. Um, with CFAA, one of the things that's interesting there is that it's intentionally vague. Um, one of the theories for CFAA is it was created in 1980 after Ronald Reagan saw the movie War Games and got really, really scared. So if you look at some of the language in this, it states that whoever intentionally accesses a computer without authorization or exceeds authorized access, it's not quite clear what exceeds authorized access means, and thereby obtains information from any protected computer shall be punished as provided in subsequent uh, subsection C of this section, and so forth. But again, it's this exceeds authorized access, which is a little confusing and ambiguous. Um, it's in this exceeds authorized access language has been repeatedly interpreted by courts and the federal government to prohibit accessing a publicly available website in a manner that violates the website's terms of service. Um, the result of this is that the first violation carries a one-year maximum prison sentence and a fine. A second or subsequent violation carries a prison sentence of up to 10 years and a fine. Um, and so in terms of service, I mean, all of us, well, I shouldn't say all of us. I often click on terms of service without reading it. Um, terms of service are often written in a language that is uh, often in legalese, very hard to interpret. But also some terms of service are a little unexpected. So this is a terms of service for homes.com, and it says that um, without limiting the general, generality of other restrictions, said Fourth Horizon, you may not access, monitor, or copy any content or information on this website using any robot, spider, deep link, scraper, or other automated means, methodology, algorithm, or device, or any manual process for any purpose. Um, does that mean I can't take my pen and a piece of paper and write down the price of this home? Um, am I violating the, the CFAA? And is this a federal crime by my doing this? Um, and so, in, in trying to close briefly for discussion, um, I wanted to basically put out a call to action that designers have always faced ethical questions about the harm caused by their designs versus expected outcomes um, and expected benefits. And I would argue that as designers, we need to think about some of these outcomes up front and build them into our systems. Um, there are some frameworks that have long been employed and can be adapted to the online realm, but we also need to move beyond what's already there and help communicate algorithmic process. And so if we are going to do this, this breakout that was recommended, um, I, I can see two different approaches that we can go and look at. We can look at the algorithm audit and think of how one might take one of their favorite sites and create an audit for it to find some type of bias. 
Or I would argue someone can take their favorite feed and think about ways outside of typeface, outside of, of you know, a control panel to communicate that something might be happening here under the hood. So maybe we'll take a vote to see what we want to talk about. So if you uh, prefer to talk about how to audit uh, a website that hasn't been audited before, uh, that's option one. Option two was how how a, how a website might design, redesign itself to indicate some of the data that it might be hiding. Uh, if you prefer option one, raise your hand. Option two. All right, let's do that. So um, we haven't done this yet this quarter, but the way we'll roll is grab a small group around you, uh, maybe on the order of five, six people, and uh, pitch around some ideas here. We'll, how long do you want to give people to talk? Five minutes? Um, we have to 1.30? Yeah. Maybe 10 minutes? All right, so let's take okay? 10 minutes. Go ahead and chat about it. We'll come back in 10 minutes, and we'll share back and have a conversation. <laughs> Carrie is going to set the stage, and then we'll take until 1.30 when um, we wrap to, to yeah. chat about this. Um, we're interested to hear what you all have been talking about. Okay, so I'm just very, I, I already gave some examples of uh, seeing full design. I just wanted to very briefly give a very brief overview of our paper on algorithm audits. Um, in terms of auditing um, an algorithm, there's some approaches you can use. You can get the code from people. Um, often much, much harder than it looks. But one person was kind enough to give us code, uh, David Forsyth and uh, Margaret Fleck. Um, they became, they wrote this, this paper that got really famous in 1996 called Finding Naked People Online. Um, and one of the interesting things they told us about this paper was that originally it wasn't finding black people online. Um, and so they had this algorithm where he did the color processing, the smoothing texture extraction, detect skin. They actually had to go in and modify their heuristic to change the actual values to make sure it caught black people. Um, and so an algorithm audit, you know, one might argue that, oh my God, this is clear discrimination. You're making a distinction between black and white people. Or one might say, look, it's, it's people. Um, another way is to ask the users to do the audit, which is what we did with, with FeedViz. Um, and so we brought people to a lab and we, we got them there. Another way is to collect data manually, um, to sit there with some paper. And that's exactly what Latanya Sweeney did. She went online, looked at advertising, and found that if you put in a white name like Carrie Swigart or Carrie, um, you got ads like we located Carrie, um, so and so. If you put in a black name, um, you got ads like Keisha Bentley arrested. Um, and she did all of this by hand, collected all this data manually. Um, the other approach is just go ahead, scrape galore. Um, and I've already talked about some of the problems with that. Um, many startup, uh, one thing about today is that startups often have a disadvantage to other companies in that they rely on scraping and aggregating data from the web to exist. And if you're shut down for that before you make it big or someone buys you before you can make it big, if that may be your goal, but if it's not your goal, um, that can be a problem. And when we made this, this feed viz, um, the API 1.0 let us use an API. If we wanted to recreate this today, we could not. We would have to scrape because as of April 2015, um, the 2.0 of the API removed it. Um, sock puppets uh, was the next approach. And by a sock puppet, you're basically creating lots of different identities, throwing them out there and seeing what happens, similar to some of the audit work that we talked about. Um, and so, for example, Crystal Wilson found that if you go to Home Depot, um, different sock puppets got different prices for the exact same product. And this is like a really fun project to do if you're bored at Christmas, to try to see like how much the prices fluctuate throughout the day, throughout the week, and based on your location and where you are. And finally, um, my favorite approach is the collective audit. And this is the one where I think that the group here is most poised to um, to explore. In many ways, I probably should have done this before we went off into the design section. But um, this idea here, this, this site is called biddingfortravel.com. It's a bunch of people discussing um, different uh, prices using Priceline and gimmicks that they can use to get the cheapest prices and all sharing information together. That said, it's not organized in a way that's easily legible and it requires you to spend lots of time on it. But how might somebody do that? Um, and I'm going to pass the baton now to Michael. Yeah. So um, one of the groups that was just chatting to volunteer sort of maybe a, a pithy explanation, like description of what one of the most interesting observations you made was. Okay, Ali, you want to pick it up? I'm not sure what is, a, is thinking. I would say. Oh, okay, uh, uh, never mind. I can tell my thing about my friend Jesse. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Well, we just yeah, had the first. Uh, I, I can tell. Yeah. Ah, okay. 
Um, we started off just sharing examples that we've encountered of like potential bias and algorithms. And we had two, one, all the women in the group, like after they passed a certain age threshold, all their Facebook ads were for marriage and babies. And the men were like, I've never seen an ad for that. Um, and I hate that because it enforces the social norms that I, personal information here, don't want to be coerced or nudged mm -hmm. into belonging to, but those ads, they have an effect when you see them like all day, yeah. every day. Yeah, it's um, funny that you say that. One of my students told me that once she changed her status on Facebook from single to in a relationship, she was getting engagement ring ads. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, that little tweak. And it was funny that like the three dudes were like, what? <laughs> we were like, oh yeah, <laughs> for real. Um, so it's sort of, I don't know, unawareness of other people's experience. And like, that's an obvious yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, gender norms, I'll leave it at that. So on this half of the room? I'm really good at staring awkwardly until someone <laughs> volunteers. Uh, we just took some time like going through Facebook and Twitter, um, just looking to see if we could get like a non-biased view of, or a non-like tailored view of our feeds, like maybe like a, a truly chronological feed, and there was no way to do that, which we found pretty interesting. So if nothing else, like some filtering options would be nice, but we also were thinking that I really liked his idea of uh, like a, a knob, similar to like the inner circle and outer circle knob, but like a knob that just kind of changed how tailored your feed would be. Mm. For Facebook, there is an extra button beside the news feed, and you click that, you can tr change that to basic, only sort your timeline based on time. Oh, I'll check that out. I couldn't find it. Yeah, it reverts back to top stories after a while, though. Yeah, it's like, if it's, it's a temporary. It's yes, a temporary. It's a different uh, yeah. web page. Basically. There was someone else over here. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So very briefly, we kind of just thought about it. And really, when it comes to a lot of these sort of biases that the algorithm seems to produce, it's not necessarily the fact that um, the algorithm themselves algorithms themselves have this bias. It's the way that we sort of train them ourselves, right? Yeah. The only thing you can really do is you can supply these things with data, and they can look at that data and they can make their own intuitions based on it by simply trying to make connections and relations between the two. So kind of going off of what you proposed with the whole democratic. Uh, skew on Twitter is the fact that the only data I ever really get to see is uh, a liberal posting about Donald Trump in a negative fashion. Now I'm going to look at other articles and say, okay, that got really high. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm looking at this and this says, this is Trump category, hashtag, I'm going to maybe take these hashtags and I'm going to take some of this content and I want to say what else is hot that other people would want to see from this. So next thing you know, you have all of these feeds that are constantly um, populated with the same sort of views and hashtags and subject matter on Trump. Uh, because there's not enough data for Twitter to look at and say, okay, I can also into it and say, okay, I see that this is a positive article in relation to Trump. There's, so if there's not enough of that content to be there, um, mm -hmm. then the outcome can't work. So that's it. interesting. So you're suggesting that like we know that we have these demographic bins and we just request for more data and the ones where data is missing. So very briefly, if you kind yeah. of look at the, um, the situation of the African-American name and uh, the inmate mm -hmm. ad showing up, if you kind of think about that, you're really looking at like a much more developed form of institutional racism. If a lot of data, which is within Google systems, it's coming from prisons, is coming, is looking at a lot of African American names within the system, and maybe that kind of goes back to a little bit of Reagan era, uh, lingering with some of uh, the whole crack rock thing, which then leads to more African Americans being locked up in uh, Caucasians because of the accessibility of cocaine versus crack rock. And so then you have that whole data set is now skewed towards more African Americans being in prison, and if all Google has to know. From that is the fact that I see African American name in prison. Well, that also touches on what happened with the you know Chicago Minority Report style like algorithms for predicting crimes. Uh, the exact same thing happened there, and they found that they were wrong, um, which you know suggests like typically we find that algorithms are broken only when something very bad happens after the fact. Do you feel that the that the company or that the designer should a have foreseen this? Like, should they have designed this into the algorithm po pre, sort of pre-launch, or having seen it now, is it the, is the onus on them that they need to fix it? I'm curious for your opinion on this. I think it's hard to predict what people will choose, right? Like, you have you kind of want to necessarily know exactly what your user base of Twitter, would, like you know, you never know if Twitter is going to skew towards the millennial generation, and then right or not, the millennial generation would tend towards a liberal or 
um, Republican bias years after you create Twitter, right? So if you have this idea for this algorithm, and a couple of years later, this new trend comes along within a certain age group that ends up using your platform that you did not expect to use it, maybe in your initial design, then that sort of has this whole chain where your algorithm is no longer mm. from what you thought it would be, but it's constantly growing and evolving. Some of this, I think what you're getting at at some level is uh, an identity question for these platforms. I think Facebook, as an example, has often viewed itself as sort of like this neutral pipe that's connecting people. But I think one of the things that came out of you know the discussions post election had to do with like it's it's not neutral at some level that every design decision is sort of tweaking one direction or another or you're a media company at the end of the day like there's news pa passing through you and you have a responsibility for that and as designers I don't think we've really grappled with that very effectively yet no and it's it's weird because Facebook is sort of performing the functions that utility companies have performed to date but on top of that you know providing opinions and mm -hmm. providing almost what's the word, um, providing guidance in a way that, you know, the power company, electric company right. could never do. So give it one more, maybe from this column. Yeah. Um, is, we were wondering sort of whether the, all these big data results and uh, biases are, uh, res are in self causation of like the algorithm or just a correlation between like, let's say, race or all these biases and stuff, maybe they just have like similar culture, way of speaking or stuff like that that influences their big data to sort of correlate into the same sort of like ads instead of just like uh, the algorithms itself using the direct data itself by saying like, oh, because you're let's say black, I'm going to show you this. Instead it's sort of like they have a certain mannerism that gives them the same data to resolve these things. Yeah. You gave this example of the zip codes that might be useful here. Yeah, so, um, you know, one thing that's happening, that's happened in, in advertising for years is the use of zip codes and area codes, which are meant to be proxies for other characteristics that should not have been used. Um, and so, one of the things that we were talking about at lunch was this idea of, you know, proxy variables might end up being used, and even the actual ones may end up being created inside of some sort of deep learning algorithm. We just don't know it. And then we see these outcomes at the end, but have no way to tell what's happening on the inside. Even designers wouldn't know. The question with that is, it can that still be considered bias, or is that just like a side effect that's like there? Yeah, so we wrote, we wrote a different paper, if you're interested, I can send it to you, about how you would interrogate such algorithms in terms of ethics. So I could go on for hours about this, but there's deontological ethics. Um, there's, there's ethics that say that it's all that matters is your intent. There's other ethics that say that all that matters is the outcome. Um, and depending on which ethical ideology you subscribe to, um, then you see wh where the law applies there. Um, but people haven't looked at this. People haven't looked at this. People have looked at law and ethics in the past, law and economics in the past, but I, I imagine that lawmakers are gonna have to take this into con serious consideration. Um, for example, more recently, Facebook just stopped advertising about jobs and housing and loans um, using uh, gender, ethnicity, race um, because of a lawsuit. So that's a starting point. But it was very explicit there. They knew that variable. If that variable switched to a zip code or if that variable switched to some other parameter that we don't know or some weighted sum of parameters, um, how do we find that out? How do we do these audits? And how do we follow the, the mandate that was given by the government so many years ago to get third parties to do it, especially when they won't let me walk into their vault and just say, I'm just going to you know, take this algorithm and see what happens without even having the training data. I mean, the question is, is that even possible to sort of have any form of classifying or filtering system without sort of like eventually getting to set up that sort of outcome or getting those types of variables? Because the whole idea of big data is to try and from the amount of data you have, mm -hmm. try to figure out all the other data you can generate yeah. out of it. So yeah. can you really say that? Can you really like consider it like that? Consider what exactly? But you're asking, can you have personalization you, well, without the, bias? Yeah. So, OK, so what you're saying there, so for ads, like one thing I was telling folks was that since coming to San Francisco, the ads actually been so much better for me than they've ever been before. And I've never actually clicked on an ad in my life, maybe once unintentionally. Um, but for once, they actually worked for me. 
Um, not enough to click on, but you know, I'm like, okay, I can almost see why that's there. And there's this, this idea in the future that I believe that ads can be like a communication between somebody where this is exactly what I need at this right time. It's not there yet. For example, like if I buy a wallet at Amazon for some reason, the next day it keeps advertising for a wallet, even though you probably only need one a year, maybe two years, not one a day. Um, so the systems aren't, aren't perfect yet, but this idea of an algorithm being personalized I think is very beneficial. However, um, when it comes to actually breaking the law and hurting some people over others, the rich getting richer, poor getting poorer, that's where the law steps in and tries to use policy to change it. And what we're trying to say is that maybe for these things, we can actually go in there and figure out what's happening in the algorithms to try to tweak them. But not for everything. I mean, personalization is great for many things. I mean, I don't want to be recommended books about, uh, I don't know, about, you know, I can't think of anything I'm not interested in at the moment. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you were to, you know, well, I can tell you what I would like. I wouldn't mind a book about a dinosaur. Like, I wouldn't mind a book about, um, but the other thing is that people don't always use systems the way they're intended to be used. So, for example, if you were to look at my Netflix stream, you would see, you know, shows that I watch, and then somewhere in there, there's interspersed a Curious George image. And that's because a five-year-old decided to take over my stream and use it, even though it's collecting data for me. And this happens all the time. And so even though these algorithms have certain assumptions of how they're going to be used, we don't always use them that way. So we'll close here. Let's continue the conversation offline. Um, we still have the room if you want to stick around and chat. Um, you can chat with Carrie in person. Let's thank her one more time.